So it has been brought to my attention through a slew of comments over the last couple of months that the last video I put out on answering the eternal question of how I do my hair is now at this point several years old, which if you can even find it on my channel at this point is now slightly out of date considering that my hair styling has, as styles tend to do, evolved over the years. And this style will continue to evolve probably even more, but therein I suppose highlights the great overall thesis. The secret to getting a style that looks right is a matter of regular repetition. It is training your hands, it is training your hair, it is training your regular autonomous routine to do the same thing over and over again until it is how you want it to be. This video will only speak to the turn of the century Gibson girl-esque style in both hair and makeup, which I presume is why you clicked on this video. If not, I suppose you're in the wrong place. I'm not a makeup professional, I just use what has been working for me for years and what works with my own coloring, so I'm also not hugely keen on naming brands or colors because of course everyone's face is different and I'm not sure how useful any of this will be outside of my own face. I'm not sure that I can be the authority to advise on any of that. In terms of the actual process, first I begin at the natural point of beginning covering up the blemishes. I personally only use a concealer. I don't use foundation. My skin doesn't like foundation. I like to steer clear of anything that incorporates shimmers or highlights in it, which is very difficult to come by these days, I know, because shimmering and highlighting is the trend. I find that Highlight and shimmer and iridescence is one of those things that really will pull you out of that anachronistic feel. You kind of can't really overdo this, especially if you're trying to go for a historical look, especially if you're trying to go for like an 18th century or 16th century look. I'm just using a powder here to prime my eyelids. I think that is the terminology that ye old makeup gurus use. That just helps to allow the pigments that I'm here to forth about to apply to my eyelids just sit a little bit more smoothly and not be as blotchy. This here is just a bit of charcoal eyeshadow, which I am brushing onto a tiny little brush and using just to darken the lash line a little bit. Then I just do a little bit of eyeshadow. Once again, this is matte without shimmer, which once again is really difficult to find these days. Okay, again, your coloring makes this relative to you, but personally, I have matched my eyeshadow shade to the veins in my eyelids, just because I feel like that coloring will look more natural on my face. Like, my color palette is already here. I might as well just pick the colors that already exist to blend better. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to do anything fancy or artistic here. And I used to have this one perfect shade of like bruised plum that matched perfectly and then all of a sudden one day they started mixing it with shimmers and you couldn't get it matte anymore and I had to switch to this color which doesn't match as nicely but it will do for now. This I will put on the outside corners of my eyes as well as one little dab on the inside corner. I don't go all the way across the crease. This I'm not sure if this is actually a historical technique but I find that leaving that middle bit creates the illusion that you've got a bit of light hitting the front of your eye which is something that you see very prominently in the Charles Dana Gibson and sketches. He draws his figures with a light hitting the eyelids in a very specific way and I find that this sort of creates the illusion of that a little bit better. Mascara is not historically accurate to especially the 19th century, but into the beginning part of the 20th century, they could darken their eyelashes a bit. This I will use really only if I'm going on camera and I need to be a bit more seen. I just really put it on the outer couple of eyelashes just to darken and extend those a little bit, but I don't put that on my entire repertoire of eyelashes. <laughs> Once again, my lipstick shade will depend on if I'm going on camera and what I'm shooting that day. If I'm shooting a face to camera video, those I tend to go for much darker or brighter red lipsticks. I do, when I film those videos, put the camera rather far away, which means again that a lot of detail can be lost. If you know about depth of field and lens distortion and all that fun stuff, watch one of those videos where they demonstrate the focal length difference on a portrait. It's absolutely insane, but it completely distorts your entire face. Once again, what you are seeing through the lens 
of the camera is not necessarily what exists in real life because depending on where the camera is placed and depending on the level of zoom that has been applied to the lens, a person's face can look entirely different. So that is the finished makeup look. Moving on to the hair, I wear it up pretty much every day. It has evolved slightly over the years, but I do it sort of in different configurations depending on the day. This is the one that I do most commonly for presentational videos. Sometimes I'll plait it before I put it up. Sometimes I will just pile it on top of my head. Sometimes I will do the front puffy bits and sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll either just put it up in a tight sort of ballerina bun or I'll just leave it loose, plait it, and then sort of coil that up and stick a pin through it in the back of my head. So it depends on the day, it depends how much effort I feel like putting in. This hairstyle, I will say, because I have done it so often, I've got the system down, it really only takes me about five minutes to do this. But once again, disclaimer, this all depends on your hair type, structure, texture, etc. Your scalp oil composition, all that fun stuff will play a role in how your hair behaves. Additionally, the shape of your face will also play a huge role in perhaps determining how you like the sculpty bits to be. So personally, lately, I have been slightly offsetting the part, slightly to the side, the side with the most amount of distance length. I'll just sort of pick that up, pile that on top of my head, and then I'll sort of cross it over to the other side and swirl it back the other way just to create this little S-shaped wave. This works a lot better if your hair is not clean. I only wash my hair once a week, sometimes every 10 days. Dry shampoo is your best friend for this. The other side of the hair I will also pull up in a similar fashion and just sort of pin right on top, near about to where the other pins are. When pinning these bits, the closer you pin it to the front of the head, the higher and the sturdier the poof will be. If you pin it too far back, your poof will be a bit flatter, which may be what you're going for, or it may not be what you're going for. So adjust the positioning of your pin accordingly to however, again, works best for you. You can also vary the height and the placement of these poofs. Different face shapes will be flattered better with either a higher hairdo or a wider hairdo or different piles and configurations, asymmetrical, symmetrical, what have you. Next, I am taking one of these side bottom pieces, gathering that up neatly, and then just pinning that right again on top of the head. I'm trying to keep my pins roughly in the same place. These will all be hidden when you pile the rest of the hair on top of the head. So if you don't have a whole lot of extra hair, if your hair isn't so long, or if you're not using a hair piece, then you may want to try and keep the pins as close as possible. Or possibly if you can, pin further back onto the head so that you don't have to bring the bun as far up in order to hide those pins. And then with the remaining hair, that can either be plaited or it can just simply be twisted and piled up on top of the head. I have recently just cut my hair so the ends are kind of all bluntly one thickness. If your hair is a bit thin at the ends, if it's sort of broken off and a bit damaged at the ends, that's actually good for this hairstyle because you will actually have some variation in the width, in the thickness of the plait. So you will actually get this really nice effect where the middle of it, the center bits, will be nice and chunky, whereas as the coil sort of goes further and further around your head it gets smaller and finer and creates a bit of textural ombre and it looks like you've got a finer plait sitting around the thicker one that's really nice but i don't exactly have that effect happening right now until my hair gets a little bit longer this is as aforementioned just coiled round to sit on top of the pin so that all those are hidden and then is just once again pinned into place the positioning of your bun may have to move a bit further back if your hair isn't so long if your hair is very short and you can really only manage the front poofy bits you can actually use a hair piece and just do that front top bun thing with just a faux plait. Hair pieces are entirely historically accurate. These hairstyles in the late Victorian period as well as all throughout history, especially the super elaborate high fashion ones, were almost always supplemented with false hair. So no shame in that. You do you. <laughs> So there we have the finished look. There is really only one important aspect that defines the Gibson girl. That one simple trick does not matter how well you have done your hair or how closely to history you have done your makeup. It is simply a matter of lifting your chin so that you can better stare down upon your enemies. I'm literally not even joking. That is exactly how he's drawn all of these portraits. Anyway, I hope this video was at all useful or just 
entertaining. In short, I hope simply that this was not a mild waste of your time, but that instead this has perhaps inspired you to go forth and live your best life. Speaking of living your best life, this video has been brought to you by Audible, a repository of copious listening material to help you do just that. Whether you prefer to escape into fiction or to fortify this reality with non-fiction, Audible is standing by to supply you with the audiobooks, podcasts, plays, meditations, and sundry such listening materials as you so please. All right. Everyday tasks such as getting ready in the morning, sewing, making food, and commuting are made all the more productive and enjoyable when you have something to inspire you. And rare are the times I am not enhancing my own mundane tasks without the company of a nice audiobook. Lately, I've been exploring the ideas of James Clear in his audiobook entitled Atomic Habits, from which I have been learning a lot about the importance of setting and automating systems that lead to good habits rather than setting goals with no methods for how to reach them. After all, Clear asserts, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. To explore this and thousands more engaging and inspiring titles, visit audible.com slash Bernadette or text Bernadette to 500, 500 to start listening today. Who's a good lad?